Thanks, Rebecca. Definitely the nicest introduction I've ever received. So I'll try to uh, not disappoint you. So I was really excited to have a chance to talk about unexpected moments of creative inspiration. And uh, there, were, there were five that I thought of um, from my life that might um, shed some light on this topic. A Sirius XM satellite radio, gender freedom, United Therapeutics, unlimited uh, organ transplantation, and mind cloning. Um, dinner will be provided. <laughs> <laughs> so with regard to Sirius XM uh, satellite radio, it all started on an island chain in the Indian Ocean when I was hitchhiking around the world. And I ended up on these islands. And uh, they're a very undeveloped, naturalistic place. And a friend took me uh, up to a giant satellite Earth station that was uh, on these islands. I'd never seen anything like this. It was several stories tall. And you can see it's the pride and joy of, of these islands. And I asked an engineer, what, what is going on here? And he said that uh, the giant uh, radome was tracking signals from distant spacecraft out around uh, Jupiter. And I asked, why did it have to be so large and gigantic? And uh, he said, because the signals were very, very faint. And it was necessary to have a huge antenna to collect these very faint signals. I imagined it was something like a person who was very, very hard of hearing, <laughs> trying to collect a, like you know, a little audible sounds of noise. Um, and uh, he said, yes, that was correct, and that inside this giant radome, there were actually horns that were big horns that were tuned to where this ancient, uh, this faraway spacecraft was. Um, I then asked him, you know, what would be necessary for the antenna to be very, very small, so that instead of it being like a gigantic ear horn, instead it could be like a tiny hearing aid. And he said, oh, well, that would require the satellite to be like a Death Star, something humongous, a planet-sized satellite that was broadcasting down to the Earth. Um, I said, hmm. Um, and then I asked him, well, what, what were you actually listening to from this satellite? What was the purpose of all of this stuff? He said that he was listening to just telemetry of where the satellite was, but the spacecraft actually carried a message of peace uh, from the Earth to anyone out there in the galaxy who would uh, find or be able to tune in to this spacecraft. And at that moment, I had this creative, uh, unexpected uh, moment of inspiration that I thought maybe instead of sending a message of peace out to the galaxy, uh, perhaps I could help send a message of peace back down to the Earth. And that maybe if I was just trying to send a message of peace to the Earth, instead of that gigantic Death Star, I could make perhaps a satellite that was larger than the Pioneer space probe, but smaller than the Star Wars spacecraft. So I made a beeline uh, from the Seychelles back to California at UCLA. I began to work exclusively on designing a satellite that could send a signal to an antenna um, small enough to be about the size of your thumb like a serious radio um, satellite antenna. And um, it got me on the cover of uh, magazines. Uh, people began to get excited about this prospect of satellite radio. Uh, my first effort, I was only able to design a satellite powerful enough to send telemetry. But instead of that telemetry requiring a giant uh, ray dome, Earth station like you saw on Seychelles, the telemetry could come down to an antenna that you could fit in the size of your hand. And then I went ahead and designed yet a larger, more powerful satellite. And with that, I was able to um, prove that you could send a music signal and talk signal uh, down to cars that would drive around. And um, even when they were in urban canyons, when they couldn't see the satellite, the signal could be repeated. The um, FCC proposed to approve uh, this new service to compete with AM and FM radio. Uh, what, what then ensued was what were called radio wars of the broadcasters 
trying to oppose this new idea of satellite radio. Uh, ultimately, satellite uh, radio prevailed, and today tens of millions of people listen to satellite radio throughout North America. And I find it very interesting that actually more people, including Howard Stern, uh, thank me to this day for bringing Howard Stern uh, to every nook and cranny of the United States. <laughs> then thank me even for the life-saving medicines I'm going to talk about uh, later. So <laughs> it shows you the power of information. Um, so in summary, I think what, what was a, the inspiration behind uh, SiriusXM, there was curiosity about the world. I was just curious about this huge radar. I didn't just want to walk past it. Um, I talked to the guy. I was fascinated about what he had to say. Um, there was a question of authority. I, I didn't want to just think that um, it was always necessary to have a big um, antenna. I kept asking him, why couldn't you have a smaller antenna? What, why was a smaller antenna impossible? Um, there was a passion to do good. Um, I was brought up uh, by my parents with a desire to, to make the world a better place. So um, that passion to do good is something that I can't underestimate. Um, I nurtured that, pa that passion, I nurtured it, and it nurtured me. So as I came into the obstacles of those radio wars and technology obstacles, I just kept sucking on that passion of uh, wanting to do good. And that passion then gave me the energy to always find another way. And as a result, uh, there always was another way. And today, the idea of satellites transmitting to handheld antennas is commonplace. About the time that uh, Sirius was getting uh, launched and off the ground, I began to develop uh, ever stronger feelings of what's called gender dysphoria uh, by psychologists. Uh, queer people like me tend to call it gender euphoria. Uh, but uh, it's really the uh, desire to, to change one's body and one's appearance to shape one's mind. And uh, I went through sex reassignment surgery and sort of rebirthed uh, Martin as Martine. Now, during that process, I was uh, troubled all the time by feeling that I had to jump all the way from being a male to all the way to being a female, and uh, always trying to comply with all the codes of what was about being a perfect female, like previously, I had always tried to comply with the codes of what being a, what was it, what you had to do to be a perfect male. But like everybody else, I assumed that there were only two sexes. Now, during my transition, uh, being an, and my youngest daughter, uh, Genesis, developed a generally fatal illness called uh, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but she was diagnosed to have only a few years of life left. So during uh, gender explorations, I also hit the uh, library and began studying everything that I could do because the doctors told us there were no cures for this treatment. Um, she's never going to make it to even being a teenager. Uh, one of the curious things I learned was that there was a ratio of three to one females to males, as you see in the third line there. And I thought that was odd if like there were only males or females why would a disease affect uh, three-fourths females and one-fourth males, since supposedly people are like 50% of people are males, 50% females? I did further research, and I found out there's a vast number of biological dis conditions and diseases. Some affect 63% women and 37% uh, men, and every percentage in between uh, seems to have a disproportionate effect on men and women. This uh, led me to have kind of a spark of an idea that if the body, in both its function and dysfunction, is continuous um, across uh, male and female genders, then certainly the mind should be so as well, because the mind is just another part of the body. And if the body can be transgendered, as shown so clearly in the way disease presents itself, then uh, probably the mind can also be transgendered. I began to get this spark of inspiration that there weren't just two sexes, there was an infinite diversity of sexes and genders. And I think this diagram shows it well. I came up with this inspiration 
that there was actually, we were operating under an apartheid of sex, where society forced everybody to either be male or female, but the underlying reality was a continuum spectrum of gender. Um, it was around this time that the book came out, uh, women are from Venus and men are from Mars, and people told me, uh, Martine, you're, you're wrong. You know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Pick your planet. <laughs> so I, I read the book, and I found the book was just about uh, a bunch of what we would call stereotypes and, and generalizations. And uh, I think Mark Twain gave the best book review here. And so the book was all about statistics, uh, whereas people are always the exceptions. So in fact, um, um, I came up with this uh, idea, and of course many people did as well, I wrote a book about it, that any one of us can be 90% female, 10% male, 85% female, 15% male, 65% uh, male, 35% female, there's no two sexes. And uh, the book became known as An Apartheid of Sex, A Manifesto on the Freedom of Gender. So in summary, my, my unexpected moments of creative inspiration for that were curiosity about gender. I was willing to question the authority of the two-sex system. No, but most people don't question it. Again, I thank uh, my parents and, and this country. Um, it gave me a passion to do justice for the human spirit, just like I felt apartheid and feel apartheid is horrible. I feel forcing people to commit to one or another race is wrong. I think forcing people to commit to one or another gender is wrong and, and does injustice to the human spirit. Um, and all of that nurtured a passion of really why trade a future closet for a past closet. And now I'm really happy to see as I talk to people, especially younger people all the time, that the concept of infinite genders as an alternative is actually beginning to merge more and more into the mainstream. And the whole idea of LGBTQ, people being questioning or queer or indefinite about their decision of a gender is, I think, um, emerging as the new paradigm. Now, I mentioned that our daughter was uh, diagnosed with a life-threatening illness called pulmonary hypertension. And you hear, you hear, you can see the chart of the survival of this disease. It, uh, at, uh, it was 50% of the people were surviving at three years and the rest of the people were pretty much all dead at seven or eight years. So Bina and I were crying our eyes out. We were over, we finally found the best doctor at Washington uh, National Hospital on Michigan Avenue. And uh, he said, this is the situation. Um, I, um, I, I threw myself into learning about this disease. And as you can see in these uh, two pictures, the one at the left, the pulmonary arteries and veins, which are these, uh, the ones furthest away from the heart, toward the edge of the lungs. Notice how they're thinned and pruned, whereas in the picture on the right, the normal heart, they're thicker. And um, what fascinated me was uh, finding out that um, arteries are the ones that carry blood away from the heart, and veins carry blood to the heart. But all of the arteries in the body carry oxygenated blood. So because the heart pumps the blood to all the different parts of the body, and that, body, that blood is oxygenated. Whereas the only arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood are the pulmonary arteries, because the heart also pumps the blood from the heart just to the lungs to get fresh oxygen. So I thought maybe there would be a molecule that could lock onto the fact that these arteries were unique from all the other arteries and could make them fat like these and therefore carry enough blood to keep the patients alive. By the way, if you're stuck with your arteries getting pruned, as in the left, the heart is kind of stupid. It keeps trying to pump blood through there, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until like an overflated balloon, it pops and collapses. So the creative um, inspiration, unexpected moments there, was I was curious, why were the pulmonary arteries different from all other arteries? Um, maybe a medicine could affect just them and relieve the pulmonary pressure. So um, I began to look up in the Reader's Guide to Periodical, kind of the, the 90s version of Google, um, every single article about PAP, uh, pulmonary artery pressure. You see on the bottom, 
and every article about SAP, which is systemic atrial pressure. And the, these are the two charts on the bottom. So the problem is if you just, if you just dilate all of the arteries in the, blood, in the person's body, um, a person with pulmonary artery pressure has normal blood pressure in the rest of their body. So now you've just dropped their pressure in all the rest of their body, and they collapse, just like you would not want to give an antihypertensive drug to a person with normal blood pressure. They just collapse from low blood pressure. So I had to find a drug that only worked on these certain arteries. And I, I went through you know, hundreds of articles that mentioned somewhere in there pulmonary artery pressure until I finally found one with a drug that you can see in the lower left-hand corner that um, soon after the drug is given, you see how the curve goes down for the pulmonary artery pressure. That's good. It goes back up because the drug washed out of the person's system. And you see on the right how the systemic atrial pressure stayed more or less the same. This was exactly what I was looking for, a pulmonary selective vasodilator. Pulmonary selective vasodilator. I thought I had found it. And in fact, I did. Uh, while it's a long story, I eventually turned that molecule into now several different medicines. All of these are approved by the FDA and the Euro and European and Israeli countries all over the world, China and Japan. And there are now uh, tens of thousands of people alive with pulmonary hypertension, whereas when we started, there were only 3,000 people alive with pulmonary hypertension because everybody died. Now everybody doesn't die. And all those tens of thousands of people are, are people who wouldn't otherwise be alive. <laughs> of course, it's, a, it's the only reason I can really stand up and give this presentation is because our own daughter, Genesis, uh, who Rebecca kindly mentioned, is also very much alive thanks to these medicines. So the unexpected moments of inspiration. I questioned authority that a satellite expert could create a new medicine. Of course, that's what I first heard when I tried to do this. People told me I didn't, I didn't have the qualifications, didn't know what I was talking about. Um, I had a passion for saving Genesis that would lead me to work night and day, and I wouldn't care how many people slap me in the face, they keep on going. And uh, a passion for saving the daughter required really me to be act very practically and, and, and develop things in a disciplined, practical fashion to go step by step. Uh, today, Genesis uh, takes pills, and we have pills approved by the FDA. Originally, we had to have a subcutaneous delivery system and an inhalation system. So it's OK. Uh, to not have the perfect solution on day one. I think it was uh, Voltaire who said the perfect is the enemy of the good, but the uh, better can actually be the friend of the good. Uh, even the perfect can be the friend of the good if you segue it, if you're willing to go step by step by step. So um, during the process of pulmonary hypertension research, I learned that no patient with pulmonary hypertension uh, ever died after getting a lung transplant. And immediately, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, here was a cure. You just swap out the part. Um, however, then the bad news began set settling in. About a quarter of a million P Americans a year die of lung disease, excluding the ones with lung cancer. Uh, but only about 2,000 Americans a year get a lung transplant. So only about one person out of 100, the red person here, uh, gets the lung transplant that could save their life. Um, further bad news is that survival with lung transplants was about as bad as survival with pulmonary hypertension. It is true that when you were at the end of your time with pulmonary hypertension, you could get another five or maybe ten years with a lung transplant, but that's still a pretty short time if you're a teenage girl. So by uh, chance, I happened to meet an amazing lady, uh, Dame uh, Julia Pollock from the UK. She was a histopathologist, uh, looked at tissues at the side of a transplant surgeon, and um, she was a head of histopathology at Imperial College of Medicine. Ironically, she developed uh, pulmonary hypertension herself and ultimately had her life saved with a lung transplant uh, by Sir Magda Yacoub in the United Kingdom. So I met Julia in my now being very prominent in the pulmonary hypertension uh, community. And she said to me, you know, Martine, I'm working with somebody in Imperial College who has been able to take stem cells 
differentiate them into being the type of skin cell that uh, grows into a jaw. And uh, we are beginning to grow jaws over a kind of a structure or a template, um, what's kind of called a scaffold. So people who have lost all of their jaws due to a terrible accident or disease, we will be able to begin regrowing jaws. And um, as you know by now, the eyeball is like, wow, the wide eye, the light uh, goes off in my eyes. And I was curious that the transplantation seemed somewhat similar to being transgendered because it crossed the border. So I was intrinsically very interested in that. Um, I was questioning authority in terms of why was everybody in the pulmonary hypertension field not admitting that a transplant was a cure for pulmonary hypertension, um, which they weren't. And, and there were probably the reasons were that there were so few available. And it made me begin to think that 3D printing of scaffolds, like Julia Pollock was telling me people were beginning to do for jawbones, uh, could in fact uh, be done for the lung. And that instead of using a, uh, stem cells, you could um, take a person's uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells, which are, in other words, they're differentiated cells. You've turned into stem cells that have their same DNA and re-differentiate them back into being lung cells that could then grow around a 3D printed scaffold. So that is, in fact, uh, what I'm hard at work at right now. It is a passion that I feel I finally found a cure for Jenny. If our medicine stopped working, I hope that um, a lung transplant can definitively cure her. Um, it's a passion that's supercharged by thinking how much good it can do for other people. It is horrible that um, upwards of 3,000 people a year still die of pulmonary hypertension. It's even more horrible that you think you know worldwide uh, over a million people a year die of end-stage uh, lung disease that could be saved. Um, and it's a passion because I feel that there are practical steps I could take to get there. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is we are recycling lungs that people have kindly donated um, during their lifetime, but they've been in a car accident, and the, the surgeons go to take their lungs, and the lungs look terrible, and the surgeons say, we're sorry, we can't use them. By the way, that happens to 80% of the lungs that people donate uh, for transplantation from the people who other organs are used. And uh, we have discovered a way that we can now um, reperfuse and reventilate those lungs outside of a body for enough hours for them to then be acceptable for transplantation. And we're doing that right here in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, just last week, uh, we saved the second patient's life with a recycled lung that would have otherwise gone into bio waste. The next step beyond that is to take xeno organs, which are genetically engineered uh, pig organs, and use those um, to even further increase the supply of organs. And all of these steps are giving us the uh, technology to then use a universal stem cell line to grow those universal stem cells over a scaffold. And then finally, with the patient's own uh, stem cells, to use those to differentiate. Usually with end-stage lung disease, you know it's coming. Um, you've got a year, two years um, ahead of time. Believe it or not, it only takes uh, eight weeks to completely cover a lung scaffold the size of a, of a normal human lung with de-differentiated stem cells. So within eight weeks, you could grow your own lungs. And um, I'm confident uh, that we will do it. Um, while I was working at United, thank you. After I've done it. Um, while I was working at United Therapeutics, one of our shareholders, uh, Patricia uh, Kluge, came up to me one day and gave me um, a book of Ray Kurzweil uh, that had this chart in it that showed that um, at the rate that we were advancing in computer technology, uh, within 20 years or so, uh, computers, would, computers would be able to have the same amount of memory and processing capability and processing speed as a human mind. Um, that was really interesting to me. Uh, because uh, Bina and I were rounding our 25th anniversary, and we were you know, getting to be the age when we were thinking, okay, how can we keep this love affair you know, going for 100 years rather than you know, the three score plus 10 or whatever you're gonna get? So um, we, were, we were thinking about how we can keep our love affair going, and hence we had already signed up for cryonization, 
uh, with Alcor in Arizona, where you know, at the moment of your death, you're quick frozen, and then you're basically transported into the future, and you hope, like you know, 100 years from now, there's nanotechnology that can defreeze you, and we can get back to kissing, snuggling, and doing all the cool things we do. The problem, though, is that this Alcor process is is not good if you if your body is autopsied, uh, which can certainly happen. Um, it's not too good if you happen to die in your sleep before anybody knows about it. It's 10 years later and you're kind of like um, spongy. Um, <laughs> it's certainly not good if you die in an airplane. Uh, so um, I began to think, you know, if there are any other solution here. And the idea came to my mind that Kurzweil had hit upon another solution. That, um, that uh, the sort of software technology that Kurzweil described uh, mindware and mind files was coming. The mindware, the ability to have a consciousness operating system, wasn't here yet. But what was here already was the ability to create a mind file, to create the reservoir uh, repertoire of all of your beliefs, attitudes, uh, feelings, memories, personality, recollections, and feelings. That kind of software technology is here today. Anybody who uses Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google+, um, any online, anything is creating a massive mind file of their personality. Um, so I thought that one thing that would be practical that could be done right now would be to offer to the public a free way to create a mind file, to include in websites all the best psychological tests that people have, the big five, the big 20. There's all sorts of different psychological tests that supposedly capture a mind file. Make this available for everybody so that they can save their mind file now and then when mindware comes available in 10 or 20 years, if they want, they can recapitulate their consciousness um, online with that mind file. So um, people objected to me. They said, no, consciousness is limited to the brain. Um, there's no possibility of having consciousness outside your brain. But I was skeptical about that. I had this kind of spark of inspiration. I said, you know, it seems to me that like consciousness is to brains as flight is to birds. Uh, yes, brains absolutely give rise to awesome consciousness. Um, best thing in the universe, in my opinion. Um, birds also give rise to awesome flight. I don't think there's anything in the universe that flies more beautifully than a bird, and all the diversity of the different kinds of ways that birds fly. But it is undeniable that planes also fly, you know, drones, toy planes, big planes, supersonic planes, every kind of planes also fly. They can't do everything a bird can do, but they can do an awful lot of the things that birds can do. Some of the things they don't do, like lying eggs, laying eggs, and eating worms, are not really necessary. <laughs> and um, so I began to think that, wow, software, you know, is like aircraft. And um, I would tell people all the time that birds are not like planes, uh, but they still fly. And I think that, that, that meme is beginning to get across to people. <clears throat> Um, I also point out that some people say, well, it's not practical. How can you like store um, in a software every single moment that you've ever experienced? But you know, here, uh, the old guy, Ebbing, Ebbinghaus, who I guess I'm around 100 something years old by now, um, he's done a lot of experiments. We actually remember very, very little of what we experience. So it's like, you know, something like on the order of 20% after a week. It doesn't matter. The main things are universal to all people and uh, things like, this being here at, um, at AVAMP today and soaking up this awesome positive energy, the, the, the journey through what is possible that people might have thought was impossible, the journey through human nature. We'll remember all this. We're not going to remember you know, much more than that in terms of the details of my talk or any of the other talks. So we have uh, created a nonprofit foundation, kind of like Astronaut. We call it LifeNot. And it's a place where people can, for free, create a bio file and a mind file. And at any time they want to, they can download all that information. And hopefully in, in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Kurzweil will be right. And there'll be consciousness operating systems that can recapitulate your consciousness. You would be living in an online world, but a lot of us are kind of doing that already. <laughs> so the inspirational driver here was I was curious about technology and identity. I was able to question the authority of one body, one mind. That's, I think, the big question of authority here. Everybody felt like, you know, if you are you, you have to only be in this one body. And Bina and I always say to each other, two bodies, uh, one soul, forever in love. So I've never really been too hung up on being limited to one body. And I feel right at home with remote viewing 
and, um, and all the different types of laughter that's common across species, too. Um, a passion of love between Bina and I is what really has driven this project. We're just really keenly interested in keeping our love affair going you know, for centuries. All the other good that this will happen, allowing great grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents to pass down their wisdom and knowledge to everybody else, uh, that's good too. So I'm happy for all the other good, goodness that will come. And finally, the practicality of creating mind files today. For me, it's all about being practical too. Um, I am taking this uh, opportunity about talking about virtual humanity and mind cloning. People say, well, what can we do today besides creating mind files? I say one thing we should be doing is preparing the world to accept our virtual selves as being real people uh, with real feelings and real rights. And I think we can do that by starting to treat the flesh and blood people who are in our midst as real people, for example, accepting all the undocumented immigrants amongst us. Yeah. So, in summary, I think when I came to the end two slides of this, I thought it really has come down to four uh, terms in terms of moments of creative inspiration for me. Uh, first, there's always curiosity. What better place to nurture a kid's or adult's curiosity than the American Visionary Arts Museum? They gave a message. Uh, second, uh, questioning authority. I think we do that pretty well here, too. <laughs> Uh, third, having a passion for good, and uh, fourth, being uh, practical, realizing that if you have a dream, uh, you're not going to get there in one step, but uh, save with the journey. Each step along the way is every bit as much fun. Thanks a lot.